If you watch sports talk shows or read sports articles, you're likely familiar with the term PER or player efficiency rating. It is the most popular and commonly used metric in basketball that measures the overall contribution a player makes. In this video, we're going to first talk about what PER is, how it's calculated, and then we'll take a look at some of its problems and see whether or not it actually works. What's up guys, welcome to MDJ, my name is Mark. Let's talk about player efficiency rating, PER, sometimes referred to as the Hollinger stat, which was invented by John Hollinger in the mid-1990s and became popularized somewhere around the early to mid-2000s. As Hollinger himself defines it, the PER sums up all a player's positive accomplishments, subtracts the negative accomplishments, and returns a per minute rating of a player's performance. In addition to that, PER is also adjusted for pace and is always compared to the league average in that particular season. The most average player of any given season will always have a 15.0 PER. So here's the entire formula for how a PER is calculated. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated. But to simplify it, it takes into account all the basic statistical categories we're familiar with. Points, assists, rebounds, free throws, three-pointers, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, turnovers, steals, and blocks. And it takes all of that and compares each to the league's average and produces a single number that attempts to quantify just how good a player is that season. Since 2017 is fresh on our minds, these were the top players according to PR last season. And at first glance, it's not too far off. The top four MVP candidates are all in the top six. And although most people would not consider Nikola Jokic or CP3 or even Isaiah top 10 players last season, they did have really good seasons and deserve to be at least considered. But here are some of the major problems with the PER stat. Number one is that it basically ignores defense. Hard back to the formula, and the only two defensive stats that PER takes into consideration are steals and blocks. Now, I could make a whole other video talking about why I think steals and blocks are overrated, but let's just say that for anyone who's been watching basketball for a while, you know that steals and blocks are not good indicators of how good a player is defensively. It's a bit of a problem when PER ranks Avery Bradley the 151st best player in the league behind Benno Udry and Jeremy Lamb. And it's also a problem when Patrick Beverly is the 204th best player in the league behind Shabazz Napier. And it's also a problem that the reigning defensive player of the year, Draymond Green, is tied for 96th according to PER behind David West, Scala Bissier, and Thomas Robinson. So it's pretty clear that PER is not an accurate representation of how good a player is defensively. On offense, the stat has a couple flaws as well, three main ones in my eyes. The first is that it overvalues rebounding. PR only takes into consideration the rebounds you get and not the ones you don't get. So it rewards players for stealing rebounds from their teammates and doesn't punish players for not boxing out. Out of the top 40 PR players last season, 20 of those players are big men that spent all their time playing either power forward or center, which is completely against our understanding of how perimeter wing players are supposed to be the more valuable ones in today's league. Now, what could also be a factor that causes this trend is that PR does not value free throw shooting enough. It's a big reason why I think Andre Drummond is one of the most overrated players in the league. It's because he posts up a lot of points, a lot of rebounds, a great field goal percentage, but the Pistons can't play him late in games because the guy can't hit a goddamn free throw to save his life. And so a stat like PR does not take into consideration the kryptonite hack -a shack strategy that plagues so many of today's great big men. The second major flaw is that PER overvalues volume players. This is a graph that plots PER against usage rate. For those unfamiliar with the term, usage rate measures how often a player uses their team's possession. And looking at the graph, you can clearly see a correlation. A player like Trevor Ariza, who plays good defense, shoots well from three, makes the right play, but is a low volume scorer and ball handler, is ranked 225th in the league, behind Terrence Ross and Marco Bellinelli, who take more shots per minute but offer no other contributions other than their shooting, unlike Trevor Ariza. The third major flaw with PER in my eyes is that it undervalues minutes per game. Everything in PER is adjusted to a per minute basis. And while that does help get rid of some players that put up impressive numbers simply because they're playing a lot of minutes, it also tends to overvalue bench players that have great per minute stats and efficiency and thus great PERs, but mostly because they're going up against other second units. So in other words, Kyle O'Quinn and Marcus Sol are not the same caliber player, and neither Allen Williams nor Brandon Bass are even remotely close to being top 50. And, and JaVale McGee is most definitely not the 13th most valuable player in the league. Oh, wow. 
Okay, so at this point in the video, you might have a pretty negative opinion on PR because I did go pretty hard at it. But because I have way too much respect for John Hollinger and what he's meant for basketball analytics, I'm going to list three reasons why PR still matters and is still valuable. Number one is that while PR has its flaws, it does usually provide a decent framework for casual NBA fans who don't know much about a particular player. So for certain sports talk shows on mainstream media outlets and sports analysts that have to cover a variety of topics in a very small time frame, PR saves them time from watching tape on a player that they don't usually watch. Although it's obviously a very lazy approach that does not satisfy hardcore NBA fans, but is enough to satisfy a good portion of the talk show audience. The second use for PR is that it's actually a pretty decent way for us to compare players across different seasons. Me personally, I'm strongly against comparing players across generations, but because we love doing it so much anyways, PR is a good measure because it does compare a player's performance that season to the league average that season. So in simpler terms, PR does measure how much more outstanding you are compared to your peers. And so when we take a look at the top single season PR ratings, we do see that it confirms our notions of some of the best seasons in NBA history. Wilt's monster 50 points per game seasons in the 60s, LeBron James in 2009, 2013, Michael Jordan, of course, and also Steph Curry's 2016 unanimous MVP campaign. And finally, the last important part of PR that's really valuable is what it has meant for basketball analytics. For all intents and purposes, PR was the first basketball stat that summarized the overall impact of a player that people actually acknowledge as being somewhat legitimate. The holy grail of sports analytics is when you can quantify a player's value into a single metric. Now, there is an ongoing debate on whether or not that's even possible, but regardless, PR was the first thing that came even remotely close. And it gave birth to a lot more recent, more advanced statistics that we use now, like box plus minus and value over replacement player, which both inherit analytical concepts that PR popularized. <laughs> here's an analogy for you. I kind of view PR the same way I view the triangle offense. And here's what I mean by that. Because of Phil Jackson's less than pleasant tenure with the Knicks, people have started to talk a lot about how the triangle offense is dead. And the people who say that are partially right. They're right in the sense that the traditional triangle offense that Phil ran with MJ and Kobe no longer works as well in today's league because it features way too much isolation and doesn't generate as many threes as you would like for a modern day NBA offense. But you also can't say that it's dead because there are a lot of teams that still use triangle concepts in their offense, like the high post actions and the off ball cutting you see with the Warriors and the Spurs. I think PER is the same. Basketball analytics has advanced too much in the past 10 years, especially in the past three to four years, for us to continue viewing PER as the pinnacle player rating statistic. But there's no doubting that A, for its time, it was highly effective, just like the triangle was, and B, it did leave a lasting legacy and impact on modern day versions. So in conclusion, no, PR does not really work when you're trying to rank players and compare players, but it still has its uses in today's sports media landscape and will always be remembered as an irreplaceable contributor to modern day basketball analytics. Thanks for watching. I went through about a dozen or so articles doing research for this video. So I'll link everything I've ever read down in the description below because people a lot smarter than me have been writing about this for years. If you enjoyed this video, give it a big like, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Other than that, my name is Mark, AKA MDJ. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.